So today I would like to report on some work um, that I've done over the last years um, locally with Johannes Keller and uh, Nate Schilling in Munich and also some work with uh, George and Florian um, Kogelbauer is going to um, be referred to in the, in the talk. So let's jump right into the topic um, without much ado and show, me, uh, uh, show you a simulation that was featured already in, in a different talk today. Um, so this is an advection diffusion simulation in Lagrangian coordinates. Um, the velocity, so this is over 90 days. The velocity field is from Aviso. And in the spatial formulation, I have chosen a, a very weak uh, diffusivity. Um, spatial temporally homogeneous and isotropic. So the, the most classic and the, the simplest case, I've treated coordinates um, as Euclidean, and then I ran the advection diffusion simulation, and this is what, what happens. So as, we, as we've discussed uh, this morning already, so there are a couple of um, initial conditions here, a couple of blobs. Um, then uh, copies of them shifted arbitrarily. Then I launched the advection diffusion process, and then I see, um, and then I see, let's run this again. So what we observe is a very strong inhomogeneity in, in the Lagrangian diffusion. It's a time-dependent diffusion. It's um, clearly anisotropic. So this is, this is uh, uh, basically, Im imagine you, you run the advection diffusion simulation as usual in, in spatial coordinates and then you get this, the advection diffusion solution, so the scalar density, and then you map it back to the initial conditions and keep track of it in those coordinates. That's why basically nothing really moves, so what you see is the effect of diffusion, well, it's not diffusion only, it's the combined effect of advection and diffusion. So the, the, the main point here was, It's not, it's not subtraction, it's basically composition um, with the flow map. So you, you, you plug in the, the particle label, you map it by the flow map, and then you read off the scalar density at that point. So you map, so you, you map the, the, the scalar value over the initial condition, and that for all the initial conditions in the fluid domain. That's right. So, so the, two, the two boundary cases here are um, no advection, just diffusion, as I've described. Then you would not see a difference between, between the diffusion out of this one and the diffusion out of this shifted copy, or out of this and out of this. Uh, the other extreme is uh, only advection, no diffusion in Lagrangian coordinates. You would see a, a steady picture. And this is a case in between where um, spatial diffusion was very weak, and yet it has a strong impact in some places and a weaker impact in other places. So you could naively argue that I have killed all reasons to see this kind of inhomogeneity except for the advection. Okay, and the goal is... Um, and. So my goal is to describe, to find a description of this diffusion geometry, if you want, of this effective diffusion geometry in the Lagrangian coordinates. All right. So a, little, a few equations um, just to, to remind everyone. So this is um, the advection diffusion equation. 
for a mass conserving flow in this landau lifshitz uh, uh, version considered over finite time, that's important, so we're not interested in asymptotics here, but this is the observational, uh, it's an observation problem here. Um, so phi is, a, is the scalar density that is uh, transported and weakly diffused, so the, the small bold D is the diffusion tensor field uh, in space. Um, rho is the, is the fluid density which is uh, um, transported. What else do we have? U is the, the, the fluid velocity. Okay, and the ND, the, the diffusion tensor field. Okay, so in this, in this model, fluid mass is preserved, but not necessarily volume. Um, this uh, um, Eulerian diffusion tensor field can be spatiotemporally inhomogeneous and anisotropic. Um, and we're interested in the low diffusivity regimes so where, uh, where this number is small. Um, so in the, in the simulation that I've, that I've shown, I think the, the, the Peckley number was something on the order of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, okay, so in this regime, in this low uh, diffusivity regime, the backbones of transport are fluid trajectories. So things is, first of all, transported with the fluid, and then only uh, on top of that comes uh, weak diffusion. So if you're interested in studying transport of these uh, weakly diffusive scalars, then La the Lagrangian coordinates or co-moving coordinates, they are nat uh, natural ones. Um, and I guess I, I, may be, I, I may be a little bit more extreme than others in the field. So to, to me, this really means let me write down equations in these coordinates. Let me do simulations in these coordinates. So I want to neglect the, the trivial part, the pure advection, which is invertible or reversible. I want to look at the, at the exciting uh, uh, interaction between advection and diffusion. So I kind of factor out um, the reversible advection and then look at what happens uh, in these coordinates. So that's, that's the goal. Okay, that may, so what does it, what does it mean to, to pass to co-moving coordinates? As I said, for scalar-valued functions, that's nothing but composition of, um, of the scalar-valued function with the flow map, so that you can instead plug in a spatial coordinate, you plug in an initial a particle coordinate, the flow map takes you to the spatial position where the particle is located at a later time, and then you read off the scalar function. For tensors, it's, it's a bit different, but standard in continuum mechanics and, and tensor calculus and, and, and whatnot. Um, so this is this transformation rule, so when capital Phi is the flow map associated with the, with the um, transport of the, of the fluid, then, then this is how this tra tensor tra uh, um, is, uh, is pulled back, uh, this is how it transforms, and then in Lagrangian coordinates we end up with this, with this equation. So the fluid density does not change over time. And um, the, the scalar density is no longer transported, but only diffused with this, well, time-dependent diffusion tensor, which is not overly surprising, so because we allowed this one to be time-dependent as well. But even if that one was, as I, in, the, in my simulation, just the identity tensor, then necessarily this becomes a time-dependent and, and, and spatially inhomogeneous tensor, and potentially uh, or, or likely anisotropic due to the um, deformation of the fluid in... in mm -hmm. Is the divergence relative to the start of the distance? It's the divergence... Um, I, I'll, I'll get to that, I guess, on the next slide, yeah. Um, the... Um, Okay, so th th there is no so there is no evolution here. So I can fix these fluid densities here because fluid density does not change over time. So th there's no th there's no time dependence coming from um, uh, density changes of the fluid, but only from the um, the transformation of the diffusion tensor. Okay, so this is uh, um, not original, but probably uncommon. So that. Um, 
the, my first re the first reference that I found is Preston Rubicki in the 80s in the astrophysical uh, from the astrophysical community. Then John Lee Tufour has um, worked with with this uh, coordinate change um, in, in, in direction diffusion problems quite a bit in the in the 2000s. And then um, yeah, I would claim that uh, so this was. Um, picked up and, and, and used um, by me and collaborators, and, and, and including uh, George with the, with the PNAS work that was uh, mentioned a few times <laughs> at this workshop. All right, so there's one thing that, that I, ever since I realized that ex excited me and kept me uh, uh, um, excited, it's the fact that so we, we, we tend to think in terms of um, Euclidean uh, structure, like uh, okay, our space is, is R3, we have a concept of uh, what is the length of objects, what is the volume of things, um, what's the surface area. Um, but you can, you can, so these things have, can, have been generalized in the mathematical community. Um, and there's one concept that is um, extremely, that I found, very appealing, which is the concept of a weighted manifold or a manifold with density. So it's, um, what is it? It's a, it's a triple of, uh, uh, consisting of a differentiable manifold, so think of, the, of some Euclidean space or um, the sphere, for example. Then on that manifold, there's a, um, a Riemannian metric tensor that allows us to take scalar products between tangent vectors, out of this concept, we, in the standard way, construct a norm by, by taking the scalar product of, of a vector with itself and then taking the square root. Then um, I think, I guess everybody's uh, well familiar with the definition of the angle um, by taking scalar products and normalizing by the length. Um, so each concept is always defined in terms of the previous one. Okay, then with, with these concepts here, we define a natural way to measure volume. I'm explaining that because I'm going to play with these things a little bit later. So how do we define a, 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 an associated volume? Well, we take a set of orthonormal vectors that form a cube, a, a full dimensional cube, and then, we and then we say, okay, this cube has volume one, and we extend that by, by saying, okay, any set that is uh, twice as big as this cube, that has twice the volume of this reference object, right? Okay, now with this concept of volume, we can go even one step further and, def and define an induced uh, concept of surface area. Let's say we have a parallel epipith, and we want to define the, the, the area of that. What do we do? Well, we define the orthogonal, so the normal vector to that parallel epipith of length one, then we measure the volume of that object, and then we say, okay, because the height was one, we take the same number as we get from the volume measurement of this full dimensional object and assign that and say this, is, this should be the area of, um, of the bottom parallel epipit. Okay, so all these things come out naturally with, with a single concept of the, the, this Riemannian metric. So these, these two things, they would form a, a Riemannian uh, manifold, but now there's uh, this, uh, this additional weight which says, okay, um, I'm, not going, I'm going to consider that manifold with all those concepts of uh, angle and norm, etc., but I'm going to put, I'm going to assume that, that the, the volume is something else but this natural, naturally induced concept of volume uh, by saying that, okay, it should, it should have some density relative to that Riemannian volume concept. So relative to that, um, to this volume, then the divergence um, takes this form. So if I want to compute the divergence relative to that specific volu uh, uh, volume form, then I um, take the, the, uh, the Riemannian divergence, and then I have this uh, one over density in front and, and, and the density in the, in the argument. By the way, I've, se I've seen this formula many times in the previous talk. So, so this is, so the theta, so you had many of these expressions like divergence of, and then there was one over h and h in the argument. 
Okay, anyway, so, so, according, so associated with such a weighted manifold now, there's a, a classic Laplace operator, like divergence and gradient. The gradient is induced by the metric and the divergence by the volume. Okay, so why is that helpful? Well, because I can, I can make the following definitions. So let M be the compact fluid domain, the one that I showed you in the first simulation, for example. Then I take the inverse of these pullback diffusion tensors, and I can use that to define a Riemannian metric um, that is adapted to the diffusion, which basically, in, 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 in intuitive terms, means that relative to this way of measuring distances and defining, for example, unit balls, um, relative to this notion of distance, my diffusion becomes isotropic. While in my spatial, in my spatial, so like in my in my static understanding of uh, what is length and, and volume, etc., um, my diffusion may be conceived as anisotropic. This is a, a deformed way of measuring length, and it makes the corresponding diffusion isotropic. Okay, and then lastly, I take um, the volume form to be basically the mass form. So say, the usual volume weighted by the mass, the volume-based mass density, okay? Then, okay, so if you compare ter term by term with the definitions above, then what, what, what this means for the Lagrangian advection diffusion equation is that you have, the, the, the time derivative is equal to epsilon, the Laplace associated to this time-dependent um, diffusion adapted metric with the mass form um, applied to phi, yeah? Or even shorter, let's abbreviate all this, all, all this notation just to be, so this is epsilon times a time-dependent Laplace operator yeah? applied to phi. So this, this takes the form of a time-dependent heat or diffusion equation where the, where the intrinsic structure of the manifold is changing over time. So this is, this is really just, I want to stress that it's, it's just reformulation, so I'm not abusing physics or anything, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing things. So this is still entirely consistent with the original physical problem, converted to Lagrangian coordinates, and then using these definitions just to, to rewrite the equation. Okay, and, uh, well, okay. So we have, so, the problem now is we're considering a time-dependent diffusion equation on a finite time interval. So because of the time dependence, that's hard enough, but we know we're interested in the small diffusion limit, so it's, it's not absurd to come up with the idea to approximate the time dependence, so the original problem, the time-dependent problem, by the averaged one. Yeah which basically means if you think of this in terms of coordinates with the a, i, j in front of the second mixed derivatives, etc., these coefficient functions are just time dependent, and what this average means is you take the average over the, over the, the, the time interval of observation. Okay, so maybe I should skip a, the, some of, the, of these details. So the result then um, is that we obtained with um, Nate is that Consider phi epsilon, so let this be the solution of the original problem, the phi bar solve the, uh, the average problem, and then take an admissible uh, initial condition. Then the, the solution of the average problem at the final time approximates the solution of the, of the time-dependent problem up to an error which is of, of a second order in epsilon. Okay, so I guess in the interest of time, I, I will skip uh, this and just mention that, okay, so I played this game of, of, of converting a diffusion problem to a geometry, so I can play the same game now with the averaged one. So I take the average diffusion tensor, take its inverse, and define um, a weighted manifold like that. So again, the fluid domain, my, my, uh, my conserved uh, mass form, 
and this adapted metric adapted to the average Lagrangian di uh, diffusion. <clears throat> okay, so as a, sim as a simple corollary to, uh, to the previous leading order diffusive flux uh, to the, to the um, approximation of the solution is, uh, so this was the, the statement of the theorem, um, this, the, so this solution here can be expanded because it's the solution of an autonomous equation now. So it's nothing but the exponential of the um, of the generator of the uh, of the equation. So to leading order, it has this representation. So if we rearrange terms now and then integrate over material subsets that have a boundary, a closed boundary, then okay, what happens is let's integrate that. So what what, what we're measuring is the content at the initial time in S of the, of, the, uh, of the scalar phi, and we subtract how much is left at the final time, right? That, that gives, gives us the outflux of S of, of, the, of the scalar phi, and then by the approximation, this is equal to this uh, expression here to the integral of, 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 over the Laplacian, the average Laplacian applied to the initial condition up to second order, and then with the divergence theorem, we get this, we get this formula, which you may recall from, uh, from previous talks by, by George or Stagios and may, may, maybe also others. <clears throat> okay, so for the, for the special case, so the result that was proved here in, 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 um, in, in this work with uh, George and, and Florian um, was more general and that it allowed um, opens, uh, open surfaces as well, so this is specific uh, to these closed ones only. Um, and um, okay, so this, this basically is, is an alternative proof of, of that approximation result. Okay, so um, what else do we have? So the um, so in that PNAS paper with George and Florian. Um, after proving this uh, approximation result, the next um, problem we asked and, 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 and addressed was, let's use that to define an intrinsic measure of diffusive permeability to surfaces, basically to compare them among each other and then, extrema, and, and then find extrema of that, of that problem. So the idea was, in, in, in simple terms, Let's stress. Uh, let's take a let's take a surface of interest. Let's stress it by hitting it with the with the scalar density that has a gradient along that um, that the boundary of uh, along that surface, and measure its response to that stress. Which and that response is um, so. What's the what's the diffusive transport out of that material surface? Okay. So the way we did it was. Um, um, uh, taking initial conditions that have the, the, the surface of interest as, as a level set, so then the gradient is normal to that surface, and then um, to, to, make it comp to make things comparable, we normalize this, um, the gradient field of, uh, of the initial condition along that, that surface, and for simplicity, I'm skipping details here, let's say, okay, so we request that this has gradient the norm of the gradient is equal to uh, constantly one along that surface, and then okay, so there is only one choice for the for the gradient of the initial condition, which is the normal field, um, the unit normal, uh, normal vector field along that that surface. Okay, so this is this is um, this is very reasonable, but for example, if you have inhomogeneous an in inhomogeneous diffusion process that has varying a varying diffusion tensor along that surface, then that would that that may yield instantaneously already at the initial time a stronger diffusive flux in some regions of the surface than in others. So it's not so, it's it's not obvious and it's not clear that there is one and only one uh, choice. Actually, I, I would like to argue that the choice of this you know, of, of the way we stress the surface is a degree of freedom. So there is no first principle that says, okay, th th there's only one way and this is how we should do it. So if, you, if, if you're willing 
you could also use a different way of normalizing that stress. For instance, you could say, let's use that geometry of mixing, so this, this, uh, the metric induced by this averaged um, diffusion, and request that with respect to this different norm now, the, the, the gradient along the, the surface is normalized, and then what comes out, so I don't have time to, to point this out uh, in detail here, but if, if one compared the formulas above and then you put the, 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 the bar on all the Gs uh, over there, then you end up with this expression here. So, the, so by assumption now, the, the gradient with respect to this average metric um, was taken to be N, the, the, the normal vector field with respect to this average uh, metric, but then G bar of n g bar, n g bar is, is exactly one. So this is the definition of, so that, that was the, the, um, the normal vector field was, was assumed to be normalized with respect to it, it, its own uh, metric. So what comes out is that here the integrand is actually constantly equal to one. So this, this first order uh, flux, the diffuser flux approximation reduces down to the to the surface area in that geometry of mixing. So the conclusion of that is, if you are about to formulate the following problem, find material subsets of the fluid domain with a given mass that have the least amount of diffusive flux, then this is exactly the isoparametric problem in that weird geometry. Okay, so the first order flux with this slightly different normalization requirement leads to a very classic geometric problem um, of, of surfaces. Okay, so I'm guess I, I'm running out of time. So we so we have also looked at the um, time dependent diffusion problem and the average diffusion problem from a, from an operator point of view. Um, so that is, we don't fix the initial, we don't fix the initial condition and see um, what the what the final how the final scalar distribution looks like, but we look at the operator that takes any initial condition um, to its final uh, distribution, and then prove um, that uh, basically the the eigenvalue uh, and singular value respectively they have the same asymptotics. Um, up to first order and epsilon, and um, the eigenvector, so the, the, sorry, the singular vector of the time average problem converges um, to, the, um, to the corresponding eigenvector, to the dominant eigenvector of, the, of this averaged uh, Laplace operator. Okay, so I guess uh, I should, uh, come to an end here. So um, I've looked at advection diffusion processes in a very strict form of, uh, of, of in, in Lagrangian coordinates. Um, a couple of uh, non-conventional aspects. I, I guess none of them is original, but in the combination, I, I, I've rarely seen that if, 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 if ever. So one thing is really to strictly formulate equations and, and do the simulations in these Lagrangian coordinates in which material is, is strictly speaking, no longer moving. Um, then there's this other aspect of taking diffusion and, and adopting a, a geometric structure on, that, on, the, on the fluid domain accordingly, and then um, rephrase uh, physical transport problems in geometric terms. Okay, concerning results, um, just to, I mean, verbally summarize that averaging is a feasible procedure um, to simplify the problem and still have um, good approximation in the vanishing diffusivity limit. Um, and out of, out of all um, weighted manifolds that you can think of, so out of all geometric structures in, 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 in the mathematical geometric sense, this geometry of mixing is the one that is the most natural uh, uh, to, to a um, advection diffusion process. Um, okay, so since I have no time 
Let me add one slide. <laughs> um, just to a quick advertisement and announcement, um, because I believe that may be of interest to some of you. So in our group, we are developing a, um, a package called coherentstructures.gl, um, written in Julia, which is capable of doing um, such global um, vortex computations in the Lagrangian, um, um, so in these concepts that were mentioned also by Javier, so in the, uh, the black hole vortices or these uh, minimal diff uh, diffusive vortices um, on this global scale within a couple of hours on a, on a regular workstation. Um, okay, so if anyone is interested, I'd be happy to, to demonstrate uh, something or explain or, or collaborate. Okay, so um, let me finish with this and thank you for your attention. Any questions? Go ahead, Branko. A small technical question. Going back to your uh, Laplacian, it seems to me to be a cocktail of things. Uh, is it plausible that that is uh, equivalent to so-called fractional derivatives? I don't think so, but I can't give... Uh, and these are, the, these, are, these are classical derivatives, it's really just that you put a weight... Yeah, the yeah. fractional derivatives are also classical, but people don't use them. From uh, uh, Carson, from uh, uh, Ertel, you know what I mean, that the derivative can be on three halves or, or, or something like that. Okay, but then where does for where does the at least I, I, I'm so I I don't I, I don't know I, I don't know I don't see how where you would get the the density from so the the, the fluid density that I imposed um, here I don't see where this should come from by taking fractional derivatives but I I'll, I'll take a look yeah I have a question uh, up to what point with your procedure, uh, uh, could you follow the procedure with, uh, uh, without assuming that epsilon is small? In other words, at, at a certain point, you started dealing with small epsilon. But the, initially, you started with, you don't care what the epsilon is, or you don't really assume that it's small, that it's necessarily. No, this was all, this is, uh, this whole project is all interested in small diffusion, so advection-dominated transport processes and, and, and small diffusion. So if epsilon is not that small, you can still not reach the form of the Lagrangian diffusion equation that you... Uh, oh, no, that you, that you can do for any epsilon. Okay. No, the, the, okay, yeah, in that sense, that is up, so there is no restriction on epsilon. The, whether or not epsilon is small plays a role in these approximation things okay. like averaging and, and that's where you would probably like to have a small epsilon to have small right. to have a good approximation of the time dependent problem by the averaged one. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Just just by looking at this picture that you identified one thousand and four hundred something features. Mm -hmm. How this, how this uh, number or density depends on this threshold value of epsilon. So if you increase it, then uh, the num number of vortices are increasing or what happens? Okay, I, I, didn't, I haven't discussed in my talk here the procedure. So that was slightly discussed by Stegios in his talk. So the, the, this procedure of defining this type of, of vortices is eventually independent of epsilon because it already does this... Um, so you see, I mean, some, somewhere here before, I think there, there was still the epsilon here. So when, when, um, so when we formulate this um, variational problem, then we normalize out these these things, yeah. So, so I skipped over that uh, with the with the norm of the. So in the, in the paper we say, okay, let's assume that the gradient has constant norm k, 
and then this is factored out. So we, we, um, we allow, uh, so, so we consider this as a first order approximation to the diffusive flux, then we normalize um, by, the, by the diffusivity. Because the reason being, if you increase the, diffus the, the, the diffusivity, you increase to a given re uh, uh, stress the, the, the diffusion response, right? If you increase the gradient, then, then you'll increase the, the, the transport. So to, to basically, the, the, the idea is really to, to, to normalize these f things out, and then eventually, in the procedure, there's no epsilon anymore. So but, okay, there is no epsilon, but there is the diffusion matrix. So what form of the diffusion matrix you take here? Is the unit matrix, or, or what is your choice? In principle, it's, it can be any. Okay, but in this simulation? I mean, not any. I mean, symmetric positive definite uh, diffusion tensors, yeah. In the, in, the first, in the very first simulation... In the very last one with the... Uh, it's, the it's the identity tensor, yeah. Okay, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, that's more op operational. Uh, so so why, why are you using Julia? Just any particular uh, advantage in doing that? I'm afraid um, that will take hours. <laughs> 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 we can talk about that. Okay, uh, that I may, maybe I should say because, it, because it's the best programming language, and then we just stop the, 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 re <laughs> the record here.